Welcome everyone. We are so happy you have decided to join us today. Um, just a few housekeeping before we get started with our side event. We are offering this in, Sp or in Spanish and French as well as English. So to switch to the languages at the bottom of your screen, or if you're using a screen reader, tabbing around, you will find a interpretation and there you will be able to switch through the different languages if you choose. We will also be having a few polls throughout our side event. And so you will, they will pop up during the time and you will choose the appropriate answer that fits you. Um, if you're having any trouble, please feel free to put your number or answer in the chat if that is easier. I will now pass it over to Federico to give that note uh, that note in Span Spanish and French, excuse me. Eh, bonjour à toutes et à tous. Uh, Aujourd'hui, la session, uh, il y a des traductions disponibles en français, en anglais. Il faut uh, pour uh, uh, faire les, les sous-titrage et les traductions, il faut le mettre tout en bas. Il y a un option que c'est des traductions, vous pouvez mettre en langue français ou espagnol. Aussi, il y a des activités qu'il faut, euh, il faut mettre euh, des, des options si tu n'as pas les, les droits ou les disponibilités de, de faire cette option. Euh, tu pourrais aussi écrire euh, ton réponse à, dans le chat. Uh, buenos, uh, buenos días a todos y a todas. Uh, hoy tenemos traducción uh, en la sesión en español y en francés. Para habilitar la traducción, uh, tienes que ir abajo, hay un botón que es interpretación, y ahí puedes ver la opción de inglés y español y francés. Y también hoy vamos a tener una encuesta uh, en donde tienes que responder por Zoom, y si no tienes la posibilidad de responder por Zoom, también puedes poner tu respuesta en el mensajero. Gracias. Great. Uh, many thanks for that. I, I guess we're all set. So, welcome everyone. My name is Hannes Ililagelius, and I'm also from the World Blind Union. Uh, I will be uh, taking you through this session today with an excellent range of, of speakers, and I hope you will enjoy the, the discussions today. Uh, just to provide a very quick overview of the session today is that we will we have the opportunity to, to hear some opening remarks. Uh, then we'll move over to a quick poll uh, because we believe in, in to also make this event a bit interactive. So we will have two quick polls after the opening remarks. And then we'll move over to the main segment of today's session, which is a panel segment. And we will end, uh, we round up the panel segment by also showcasing uh, it's, yeah, very quickly uh, present um, a new policy brief by the World Blind Union and uh, United Cities and local government towards the end of this session. So we will end with that launch um, at the top of the hour or something like that. But uh, without further ado, I'd like to welcome my, my dear colleague, Diane Bergeron, the treasurer of the World Blind Union to, to open uh, today's session with your opening remarks. So over to you, Diane. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Bonjour à tout le monde. Buenos dias a todos. So pleased to have you all here today. And what an exciting time it is. Uh, I'm in New York City at COSP, and uh, it's been a very exciting few days. Uh, we're all very tired, but we're learning a lot, and it's it's been a great time. <clears throat> Excuse me. So we're here today um, to talk uh, about, we've we've got a great session. Um, today's session is called Breaking Down Accessibility Barriers for, Through Localization, presenting at, at and unpacking recommendations for states' parties to accelerate implementation of accessibility. <clears throat> Excuse me, my throat seems to go right when I have to speak. Um, the event today is being hosted by World Blind Union, WBU, and United Cities and Local Governments, UCLG, and is co-organized with UN for Habitat, International Disability Alliance, Global Disability Innovation Hub, Cities for All Network, and the GAP Older Persons Constituent Group. The World Blind Union, WBU, is the world voice 
of the estimated 253 million people who are blind or partially sighted worldwide. UCLG is the world organization of local and regional governments representing around 250,000 municipalities. Our two organizations are working in partnership to advance the localization of global agendas and to support the realization of inclusive and accessible cities and communities in line with the CRPD, the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. We're in this webinar today as the world is rapidly becoming urbanized. The pandemic past and ongoing crisis is evidence that there is a lot that remains to be done to address persisting and emerging accessibility barriers for equal access to adequate housing, transportation, public spaces, services, healthcare, and mechanisms to contribute to urban planning and governance. We're here today as there's an urgent need for states parties to ramp up CRPD implementation and to adopt a rights-based approach to accessibility while empowering and supporting local and regional governance, local communities, people with disabilities and older persons to be at the forefront of the development and implementation of accessibility policies and practices. Localization of the global development frameworks together with the CRPD is truly a powerful tool for breaking down accessibility barriers towards a more just, inclusive urban future where we can all lead independent lives and being included in the community. We're thrilled to host and facilitate today's dialogue. We look forward to having an insightful exchange on advancing accessibility measures and exploring strategies to accelerate their implementation within our cities and communities. Very much appreciate everyone coming today and I'm gonna hand it back over. Unfortunately, I have another uh, side event to go to right now. So please enjoy the session, talk a lot, give lots of ideas and have a great time. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you, thank you so much, Diane, and uh, for, for really setting the scene for today's session. And uh, I wish you a great rest of your day running around New York, uh, and uh, hope that you will have some amazing, I'm sure you will have some amazing conversations and et cetera. So without further ado, I'm going to ask my colleague Tracy to kick off uh, two very, very quick polls, if that's possible. Uh, because we also want to learn a little bit from you as, an, as, as participants today uh, around localization and accessibility. Tracy? Yes, so the first one I am launching now. Uh, so the first, uh, the first survey is around, yeah, what word best represents your familiarity with localization in its role in accessibility. And you get four, four alternatives, very, somewhat, you're curious, or you're new to the subject. It's a very quick one. Yeah, I believe we can close the poll. Oh, uh, looks like we have a, <laughs> we have one person who is very familiar with this. And we have a three-way tie with somewhat curious and new. Okay, we're very happy to have you with us today. It's a very exciting topic. So I guess uh, without further ado, we can launch the second set of poll which is where we ask you to rate on a scale from one to 10, how accessibility friendly do you think your city is currently? 
where you have one to five, where five is uh, the best and one is, well, not that great. Okay, Tracy, I think we can close the poll. Excited all, to hear the results. All right. So we have in the lead, we have 12 out of three. So somewhere in the middle. Just a little lower than that, we have 10 at a two. Then it looks like we have eight at one. And it looks like we don't have too many cities with a four of a five. We have four at a four and two at a five. Okay, I, 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 I mean, my take on that, if I, if I were to, to comment, is that, I mean, accessibility is a journey, right? And we will never reach perfection. <laughs> accessibility is always revolving as much as the environment around us is evolving. So thank you so much for, for sharing, your, um, sharing your input to, to the polls. Uh, much appreciated. So without further ado, I'd like to um, actually rush a little bit, but I, I, I do like to kick off the main segment of today's session, which is a very interactive panel discussion with, uh, with our great speakers of today. Uh, we have Federico Battista Potier from United States Local Governments, Andrade Abdallah from International Disability Alliance, Marta Rodo Mastriera from UN Habitat, Ian McKinnon from the Global Disability Innovation Hub, and Catherine Klein, uh, the co-chair of the General Assembly of Partners, Older, Partner, uh, Older Persons Constituency Group. And how this segment will play out is that we have four guiding questions for the panel. And for each of the guiding questions, uh, we like to, to rotate a bit. So we'll give, uh, so we have assigned, we, before the webinar today, we have assigned primary speakers for each question. But we like to take a round amongst the speakers to also add uh, to the responses already provided. And to kick off this, I mean, we roughly know how the world looks like from an accessibility point of view, but we are very also interested in, in going a bit deeper. So therefore, uh, I would like to start with the first question, which is what are the current data and trends around accessibility globally? And for this, I'd like to, to invite Ian from the Global Disability Innovation Hub to share your reflections, and then we will open up for the for the other speakers to add to your to your remarks. So over to you, Ian. Thank you, Hannes. Thank you very much indeed. <clears throat> yeah. So yeah, what are the current data and trends around accessibility globally? Well, for me to answer that, I would like to refer to the research that GDI Hub is currently doing on six cities around the world as part of our UK aid funded 802030 program, which actually had an important announcement at COSP last night of significant further investment from UK government, which we're very happy about. Um, but this, this global research considers people, policy and practice to get at the heart of how inclusive or not cities are, so that we can then compare and contrast across these six, the issues and the challenges but also the opportunities and the good examples. So those six cities that I'm working in uh, and that we're working in are Ulaanbaatar in Mongolia, Varanasi in India, Surakarta in Indonesia, Nairobi in Kenya, Freetown in Sierra Leone, and Medellin in Colombia. So the point around current data, I think, is key. So. As to our knowledge, um, research of this nature is unique and yet so necessary to be able to make informed decisions and to prioritise what needs to happen to allow real change on the ground. In targeting diverse cities with a good geographic spread, <clears throat> we're also able to weed out the common principles that will be universally applicable 
But to the topic of today's side event, we can also see the nuance that exists locally and how that relates to local culture, local religions, the economy, the climate, the topography and politics, all of which have a hand in how inclusive a city is and can be. So our current research piece completes towards the end of this year, when we will then publish our global action report. But for now and today, let me give a couple of examples that capture trends around accessibility globally that we're picking up on. So the first of the two I'd like to mention is, is implementation and linked to that is education. So that this comes up a lot. You know, in, in cities we're working in policy, regulation, guidance may already exist and may even be very good. However, in most cases, there is a lack of consistent implementation. And there are multiple reasons for this, but a key one is attitudinal, in that inclusive design is simply not recognized as a priority, or at worst, is seen by some as an inconvenience. And this leads on to the need for education. So this lack of implementation is often a result of ignorance, not malice. In my experience, no one sets out to create a really bad design or to build a subpar and excluding building or environment. Often it's a case of not knowing any better and not realizing the added value of creating something truly usable, intuitive, welcoming, and that won't need alterations or add-ons further down the line. The second example then that I'd like to give of a trend around accessibility globally is climate. So climate change obviously matters and it affects persons with disabilities as it does all of us today. And climate is also a localization point as it varies wherever you are in the world with the only consistency seemingly the fact that it's increasingly inconsistent. Um, so our research in Indonesia in particular really highlighted the issues created by climate change and in particular, heavy, sustained and unpredictable rains. Flooding is an issue, the impact that has on AT use, for example, hearing aids, and even the noise created on tin roofs over continued long periods, making many homes really uncomfortable places for many people to be. So they're just a couple of really small examples, I think, of global trends, but also that recognise the importance of localization and the need to respond to the local context. Also at the local government level, sometimes there's more flexibility to try new things and for change to happen more quickly. So cities can be a real test bed for inclusive policy in the built environment and infrastructure. So I'll leave there and just say that if you're interested in any of the research that we're doing, the findings to date are available online with our global action report expected later in the year and the website is 802030.org and I can share that in the chat. Thanks. Thank you, thank you so much, much Ian, uh, for really helping us to set the stage and um, also sharing a bit about your amazing research, which is really addressing like the lack of evidence. I would say, I mean, many of us, we have, we have the lived experience, but it really, it really captures the critical evidence to inform actions moving forward. Uh, so I'd like to, to give over the mic to Alradi, if you'd like to share your perspective on, on the global trends you see when it comes to accessibility from the perspective of the International Disability Alliance. Uh, hello, everyone. Indeed, it is a pleasure to be with you in this webinar. Um, uh, just to share, thank you uh, for sharing this evidence about uh, the accessibility trend around the globe. Uh, just I would like to share from another hand, uh, in many uh, countries around the globe, in many cities, uh, local cities, we don't have uh, such concrete data and concrete information about them. While we are encouraging uh, research uh, to be more uh, accommodative of other countries, and indeed it will not be easy to have like more countries and more cities at the same time. We would like also to stress here that uh, not having uh, data is not an excuse uh, for the city not to implement accessibility measures because accessibility measures has to be already in place um, and, 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 and not having a data is not really uh, excuse not to have it. But having data will indeed help us more to identify where we are, 
uh, to make more uh, to make the to to make the case uh, based on evidence uh, to where what to know what we need to do and also uh, with help uh, with uh, with monitoring and other uh, use of data uh, in this case uh, just the stress point here that uh, not having data in many cities should not be seen as a excuse not to implement accessibility measures. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Alradi. And I think it really adds uh, adds brilliantly to, to Ian's uh, kickoff remarks. So I'd like to uh, give the mic to, to Catherine uh, for share your insights around, you know, the global trends and data we see around accessibility also from your older person's perspective. Thank you very much, Hannes. And first, I want to thank the organizers for including aging. We do have an overlap of 46% estimated of older persons with disabilities, as well as distinct needs for each group. But until I started volunteering here at the UN in New York 15 years ago, and at that time, neither of us would talk to each other for obvious reasons that people were focused on their own specific cohort. So disabilities, of course, children are born with a disability. All older persons don't have a disability, but it became fairly clear to all of us that this needed to be changed. And I'm happy to say that today, this is an example of an event where we're included. And what is the situation in terms of data. Exactly like what the last speaker said, there's very little and very little is disaggregated. I mean, if you think of an older person as defined as someone 60 and older, and more and more people are living to be 100, you wouldn't say that a 60-year-old is exactly like an 80-year-old or a 100-year-old, or the intersectionality, the difference, as you were saying, of an older person born with, uh, who has acquired a disability, lives in the rural area, is from an indigenous group, all of those are significant and go at the moment pretty unrecorded. The population of older person in the world is projected to reach nearly 12% in 2030. That's not much time. And 16% in 2050. In 2030, 1.4 billion people will be aged 60 and older globally, with a large majority living in low and middle income countries. And what I just wanted to point out, because it's not realized by most government leaders, is that the pace of population aging, of course, differs country by country. For instance, while France had almost 150 years to adapt to the change, whereby the population aged 60 and older rose from 10 to 20 percent, countries such as Brazil, China, and India will have slightly more than only 20 years to make that same adaptation. More and more older people are living in urban areas, while at the same time in many countries, a growing proportion of older people live in rural and remote communities as rural urban migration is more common among younger people. So this is just background, but to complement and suggest that many of the same issues that you're going to be hearing today also apply to us older people, but to some extent with a focus on youth, older persons are not given the resources, the services. When you talked about education, Ian being important, there are so many illiterate older persons because, for example, girls had to go and help the family at an early age and were taken out of school. Well, when they're older, being illiterate means they can't participate really in their families, in their communities, or in their governments. So I'll stop at that now. Thank you. Thank you so much, Catherine, and also for really bringing in a, a sort of an intersectional approach into the discussion on, on accessibility as well, as I know you have been championing for, for many years, that when we, put, when we try to advocate and provide technical advice around accessibility, that often the perspective on, on accessibility, specifically in the mainstream sector, is quite narrow. And we, we know, because we are, we are practitioners working with accessibility on a daily basis, that it benefits truly all of society, and that it's nece uh, necessary to take a holistic and, and also a life course approach uh, to accessibility in urban policy and planning. Uh, so thank you so much, Catherine. Without further ado, I'd like to invite Federico uh, from United States and Local Governments to 
to hear your inputs on what we see now as, as a global trends and, and data when it comes to accessibility. I know you're working very closely with quite a few uh, local and regional governments, so I'm thrilled to, to also hear your reflections on this. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, just to give a little intro, I'm, um, uh, I'm a mulatto guy, so I have a nice brown skin, a big smile. Usually uh, people say that I have a big smile with a nice cap. It makes me seem friendly. And normally my hair is let out and big, but today I have it in braids. Uh, set back because it's summer here in Barcelona. So uh, hello everyone and thank you for joining the session. Uh, thank you, Hannes, for uh, always being a close collaborator with us uh, as well as with Kathy and Ian uh, and uh, Martha representing Good Habitat. It feels like a family in house. Um, anyway, the global trends, right? Uh, it's so complicated because I think so much, um, so much is necessary with data. I think the the understanding of of how disability really is a transversal topic as well as as aging um, has been very important. And when I think about uh, the work that we're doing, so from the United States and local governments, uh, we've been prioritizing accessibility uh, throughout our programs and policies by trying to create a let's say a a force between our um, our members to put this as a priority and looking at it from the global level and really bringing it into a, a local context, which is very important in terms of uh, achieving these uh, ambitious global agendas um, that they really get translated into the communities um, that they're aiming to, to address. And we know local and regional governments are the closest, uh, whether um, it's looking at the climate emergency, whether it's looking at Social emergencies like uh, housing and homelessness, uh, local regional governments are usually at the front line. Um, and this, um, this has led us to really think about the capacity building aspect. Um, Ian mentioned something really important, which is a lot of the times um, the biggest barrier can be the attitudinal part, which is something throughout our work, specifically in our community of practice on inclusive and accessible cities and territories that we've been seeing is, um, of course, uh, no, or let's say, I wouldn't say no, but a majority of, of governments don't plan uh, for exclusion, but without having certain context, also data uh, and mechanisms to really achieve uh, more inclusive planning and strategies, those things get left out. Um, and uh, the point on attitudes I wanted to highlight because it comes out a lot um, in our community of practice because they, ask, you know, how do we um, take this part of uh, changing attitudes and put it strategically, um, you know, in terms of training and things. So there's that question about how do you change attitudes, which is a very cultural thing and takes time, uh, but invest in changing those attitudes. Um, a big thing also, because um, I don't want to go too much in depth in that part, Ian mentioned the, the point really well, but another part is also the types of mechanisms that would really ensure cross dependent departmental coordination uh, are really missing in some aspects. Um, you know, there's a project that we're doing on, on inclusive procurement uh, with different cities. And uh, one, of, uh, one of the cities, uh, because the uh, this project has brought together eight departments from that city that normally don't work together at all. Um, but the reflections came out that they don't really have a, a kind of checklist to tell them where to go to talk to somebody when they want their project to say, bring in the age dimension or or the disability dimension, no? And a lot of the times there's just a plethora of, of agencies and departments and, and people that you never get to meet. And every department is trying to, let's say, uh, go for the, uh, compete for the funding, the limited funding that's there. Um, and also sometimes without the, uh, the capacities really to, um, to execute some of the projects. And so this can, uh, without a proper mechanism in place that says, hey, there's a, we, our local government is trying to promote accessibility. Uh, this means this, and these are the departments that have technical help that could help, let's say a transportation plan or a gender, uh, a gender inclusive plan to combat gender violence to, um, to make that more equitable. And, and this was a very realistic thing that came up uh, specifically in this project, but overall it comes up often is that there is a missing link between the departments and there is a need to, to put that into place. 
Um, and also that this can also be tied into trying to change the attitudes on this because there, there is a general sense, uh, which is you know funny in some aspects, but that, uh, that this department does this, this department does that and, uh, and kind of separate. And in some areas you'll have the department for inclusion that works separately, which you know, in, if you think about it, inclusion should mean all, right? And so this creates a, a disconnect. And, um, and so those, those mechanisms that would allow for inclusion to happen, attitudes to change as well. Um, and, uh, you know, another thing that we always try to highlight as well is that we're not only, um, let's say, protecting the rights of persons with disabilities, um, but uh, having disability uh, recognized also brings that innovation in-house. And when I mean this, it's also having people with disabilities represented and working in municipalities and being at the decision-making role. And you can see when there is a diversity of representation, uh, especially the decision-making role in cities, how this helps create political will and also puts the budgets, um, priority and budgets into accessibility strategically, not only because it's a good thing to do, but if we look at other, um, if we look at other areas, it's also very innovative and, um, and brings in a lot of economy into, into the local community. So um, there's a lot of uh, things I could go into, but I wanna leave more room for the discussion. But anyway, this is kind of what we're seeing and uh, why it's so important to partner with, with organizations like, like the World Blind Union and, and uh, the other uh, panelists here. Thank you, thank you so much, uh, Federico, also for sharing, like, as you, as you really work close with local reader governments, I mean, we have had an amazing uh, collaboration for the last few years where successively we also realized together with local and reader governments that, as, as you also highlighted, the, the challenges with interagency coordination, you know, that different departments, regardless if it's at national or local level, they actually coordinate which often result to in, in a siloed approach to accessibility, as, as you pointed out before, that then maybe it's goofed into the social inclusion unit or only at the building department, et cetera. Uh, so thank you so much also for, for specifically highlighting that. Uh, we are running slightly behind, but I also wanted to inquire, Marta, if you wanted to share something around this question relating to your experience, uh, also from a hab you and Habitat perspective, on, if there is any certain trend or, or evidence you see regarding accessibility from your perspective. Thank you, Hans, and thank you all for having me here. My name is Marta, and I am part of the SDG Localization and Local Governments team based in Nairobi and from your habitat. So a lot has been said, so I'm not going to extend a lot, uh, also being um, knowledge of the time. But from UN Habitat, what um, we are working, we are working a lot with cities. So what we are seeing in the case of accessibility and which are the current gaps that they are finding right now is first of all, as it has been already said, the lack of data and like lack of disaggregated data. So from this side, we are working on the global urban monitoring framework, also known as UMF in which one of the, so it's built in uh, like four objectives and these objectives are safe and peaceful, inclusive, resilient and sustainable, which are like the city. And then it is work on five different domains, which include society, economy, environment, culture, and governments, governance and implementation. So this is our way to start working on how to get this disaggregated data and how to make sure that it is like cross-cutting and transversal. Uh, so that would be for the data and the, uh, data side. And also from the other side, I wanted to highlight what it has already been highlighted on the lack of coordination between levels and also vertical and horizontal. That means that we need to work closely on a multi-level governance approach and also on a multi-stakeholder coordination. Uh, from UN Habitat, we are also kickstarting all of this part. We released uh, very recently a research on multi-level governance for SDG localization, in which we also make this link between the importance of all the levels to make sure that we all achieve the 
the goals that we have as a like for sustainable development as a whole and to make sure that everyone is included. So that would be from from our side and back to you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Marta. And uh, I mean, to bring the discussion also a bit into the, you know, fr uh, within the scope of, of localization, uh, one of sort of our key question uh, for today's discussion is also what does actually localization mean? And why is it important for removing accessibility barriers? So I, I first like to give the mic to, to Federico, uh, try to keep it a little bit shorter, and uh, we'll right, then open so up for our other colleagues as well. We'll, so Federico, we'll make it really, really fast. I'll try to resume. It's a complicated uh, thing, but I think if we think about localization, um, and specifically, you know, with uh, within SDG, within UCLG, we're focusing a lot on SDG localization, and that um, the majority of the targets in the SDGs uh, require local uh, coordination with local and regional authorities. So this is really looking at, um, I would say, really bringing down these global frameworks and centering them around local communities. Uh, so all of their global, the whole issue is, is local and, and the people that are living there um, and, and that it's going to affect. And so in this case, um, localization basically is, um, is that bringing it down, but also not only that, uh, ensuring that there is a real collaboration between the diverse stakeholders, uh, that also um, national uh, urban policies um, have a, the context of the local level. And this includes, you know, bringing in, in the data aspect, um, you know, I hate bringing in examples because it, it makes the thing longer, but, uh, but you know, we have a really good example of, um, from a city who uh, basically uh, was uh, trying to make better efforts uh, for uh, accessibility, but they didn't have the, the right data from the national level. And so they conducted their own local uh, uh, data on, on persons with disabilities and added in the component of aging as well. Uh, and in the, the end, the national government realized that also that their data was a bit old and off and seeing that local uh, governments could really uh, assist in that area, uh, they formed a collaboration and this has improved the data, uh, which is informed better local policies, but also um, the, the allocation of funds and competencies. Um, from the national government to the local government. So that's also a big part in localization. It's really decentralizing the, the process to ensure that this uh, environment can be enabled. Okay. To be a little bit. Thank you. That was short and sweet, Federico. So I'd like to hand over the, the mic to, to Marta. As, I, as you work in the localization team of Habitat, it would be amazing to, to hear from your perspective what, what, is local, what does localization mean and what's your perspective uh, on how it can also support removing accessibility barriers to, to add to Federico's remarks. Thank you, Hans. So from our side, I think it's just complementary to what Federico said right now, but uh, SDG localization is the process of transforming the global goals into reality at the local level. But of course, this has to be in coherence with the national frameworks and in line with the community priorities. So it means placing local communities at the center of sustainable development, and it has to be anchored on the principles of partnership, inclusion, and effectiveness. Uh, we say that it's a two-way process in which the local meets the national and the global, and vice versa. So when we talk about SDG localization, we talk about the importance of local and regional governments because we acknowledge that this is the sphere of governance that it's closer to the local communities. And what we have to understand is that when we talk about uh, creating policies and strategies and so on, we need to understand which are the needs and the priorities of the local communities. It, uh, we need to tailor the policies into what is needed in this specific community. So that would be a little bit of, uh, of the definition of SDG localization. And uh, from UN Habitat, we have um, been at the very uh, beginning from, from the localization of the SDGs and even before the SDGs. And uh, we have this comprehensive approach in which we want to go from data collection, as I was talking now about uh, disaggregated data and so on, 
to the monitoring and reporting that we do it through the voluntary local reviews that now I can talk a little bit more about that, but also then uh, making sure that this creates a reality. So creating long-term planning strategies and policies. Uh, that would be a more comprehensive approach in which we look to, to make sure that the SDGs are localized, but they are in line and uh, with the national and the global level uh, and creating enabling environments uh, to do so. Uh, that would be it. If we have more time, I would maybe talk a bit more on voluntary local reviews and so on, but I will leave time to, to my colleagues to, to explain a little bit more about that. Thank you. Sure. Thank you. Thank you so much, Marta. And I think that's something uh, we're looking for for you to touch upon when we come to Another question relating to the support of uh, the national government also can collaborate with the local government around all, and on the topic of localization. I'd like to hand over the mic to Alradi if you also would like to, to share some reflections on, on what, from your perspective, what localization means in this context. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, yes, I'm, I'm going to highlight here very quickly uh, why we need to go for a localization. Uh, just let us also recognize that at the implementation level uh, in many countries, uh, the local government has the authority to do the real implementation. So in this case, uh, there will be a lot of in their hand to do the implementation regarding accessibility and so on. So uh, if we are focusing on localization, that means we are giving them uh, more power, more role. And in the same time, that should be, uh, should be uh, supported by giving them uh, the, uh, the needed resources to implement such accessibility. Uh, another point that I would like to highlight uh, also uh, local communities and local government, uh, in many cases, they are in best place uh, to know, as mentioned earlier, to know uh, about the needs of their communities and also to know what the resources they have in their community so they could mobilize well. Uh, the experiences and the resources uh, that uh, in their community and that work well with the need in the community. So meeting this uh, need uh, with the existing experience and resources uh, could create more uh, more room and space uh, for more uh, localized and uh, uh, context-specific uh, accessibility uh, in, in, in such cities. Thank you. Oh, great. No, no, thank you so much for, for adding that. And I think it also heavily interlinks with, uh, with another question we will come into shortly. It's like, just because we talk about localization, does it mean that it's either the sole responsibility of the national government or the sole responsibility of the, of the local and regional governments? It's a multi-government effort is required to, to actually foster change. And i like to, to hand it over to, to Ian, if you very briefly like to, to share your perspective on, on what is localization and how can it really support removing accessibility barriers? And if you can add to what's been said, that would be great. Sure, thanks, Anas. Um, I, I won't repeat what's been said. Suffice to say that I agree with it and the relationship between global, you know, national and local policy and frameworks and, and things is really important. Uh, for me, when I think about localization, I immediately think about the local communities and their needs and their wants and how they change from or, and are, are different from place to place, you know. So I'll give a couple of little very specific but hopefully quite nice examples that have come out of our research that we're doing. So one is, um, and it's things that before working in these different regions, cities, countries, I would just never have thought about even having worked in the sector for 20 years. Um, and we were working with, uh, with, with uh, disabled participants in our research in Varanasi in India. And we had a, a blind participant taking part in, this, in the research who made it known to us that, uh, a very specific issue living in the neighbourhood that they did, um, going out and navigating the streets with a, a white cane and the sacred cows that were kind of free to roam the streets and how walking with a white cane could quite often like spook these the sacred cows. And there were occasions where they would charge at white cane users. And that really was um, 
impacting their confidence to go out independently around the, 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 the city. And I mean, that's just something that I would never have considered in a million years, but is super local to that context, but incredibly important, you know. So how do, where, where, where do you, you know, how, how does that fit into these frameworks and, and translating policies? Likewise, working in, Varana, in Ulaanbaatar, Mongolia, with a disabled cohort of research participants, we quickly realised how important karaoke was. You know, karaoke is really big in Ulaanbaatar, and uh, and and people were commenting on the lack of accessibility of karaoke bars, but also the equipment they used and the attitudes of staff in the bars and things. So for me, you know, getting down to that real local context is about what makes these communities tick. What do they What do they want to do? What brings them joy? You know, what do they do in their social lives, and and what what are, that, that's when you can really get into that kind of fine fine level of detail that's actually really going to make a difference to people's lives. So it's for me really interesting and really important. Well, thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much for for adding that, uh, Ian as well. And uh, before moving on to the next question, I'd like to hand over to you, Kathy, uh, sure. if you want to share some of your insights on this. Sure. And again, just like Ian said, I'm not repeating all of the wonderful stuff that's come before. Localization means for aging the same difficulties of being able to be taken seriously, to be able to interact. And um, I will be talking later on the different question of how the importance of the World Health Organization age-friendly cities and communities framework has enabled groups of older persons, not necessarily OPAs, not necessarily OPDs, not necessarily self-organ, only self-organized to walk their neighborhood to figure out what is needed and to be able to work then uh, with the local authorities to make it happen. New York City, where I live, was the first city to do the local voluntary review. And a lot of that came out of, I believe, having uh, adopted the uh, age-friendly cities. We were the first city to be accredited by the World Health Organization. So there was already a step ahead of what later became part of the local voluntary review. We worked very hard, as did everybody else, to make sure that the new urban agenda, the UN Habitat, now UN Roadmap for implementing SDG 11, had specific references to aging, as well as, of course, to disability, to older persons. And um, paragraph 62 was actually a standalone, which was amazing. We've never had that in other international agreements to, quote, commit to address the social, economic, and spatial implications of aging populations where applicable, that's always UNEs, and harness the aging factor as an opportunity for new decent jobs and sustained, inclusive, and sustainable economic growth while improving the quality of life of the urban population. And I just want to mention that the whole issue of ageism, just like the discrimination against persons with disabilities, has been an important factor to why we are not being listened to or included. And the World Health Organization has a wonderful campaign with tools, guidelines, documents, support on how to do what you all have been talking about. How do you actually change the attitude of people? And one of the key findings was not only that one in three people globally are ageist, including us older persons who often can be the most ageist of all of us, um, how do we change our attitudes? And a lot of it is by participating, as you said, Hannes, with a life course approach, not just a segregated age one, and recognizing, of course, young people face ageism just on the different end of the age spectrum, but also having many intergenerational activities so that people at the local level can start to interact with each other instead of remaining in their own silos. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kathy. And that, I mean, that also brings us to considering like where we are now, what is the way forward, right? So also discussing the how-to aspects and what steps needs to be taken to, um, but like what are, for example, like what are the ways 
national and local governments can engage with our constituencies, including organizational persons with disabilities and older persons associations to really improve on accessibility at the local level, but also what steps can national and local government, together with local governments, take to really address accessibility as part of localization? So moving forward, this, this, this question is twofold. Like how can national and local governments engage with their constituencies? And what steps do we, do, we, do we believe that national and local governments need to take on accessibility as part of localization? So to, to really go a bit deeper into that, I, I want to request Alradi to, to share your reflections uh, on this two, two sponge question. Thank you so much, Hannes. Um, indeed, uh, I don't need to mention that uh, consultation and engagement of organizational persons with disabilities is not only a right and a requirement under the CRBD itself, but it also provides a lot of um, benefit and support for the implementation of accessibility, since it will be engaging uh, with uh, persons with disabilities who have the lived experience with the barriers, with the accessibility, and they are in the best place to advise in this regard. And in many cases, they will be uh, supported with uh, supporting with the design, implementation of accessibility policy, and also with the accessibility audit. So uh, it is really key for OBDs, uh, for the uh, local cities to engage with OBDs. Uh, so engaging with OBDs uh, or organizational personal disabilities, uh, should be uh, done uh, throughout uh, the implementation. I mean, through across uh, across uh, the cycle of uh, accessibility, it started from the policy design, going to the technicality of setting the standard for accessibility, the implementation, accessibility audit, and monitoring and evaluation. So, OBD should be engaged. Uh, throughout, since uh, each stage has its uh, specific uh, has its specific uh, requirement, need, and discussion. So OBDs will be in a, a good position to, robo to provide their own uh, perspective, I mean, uh, through their uh, lived experience in this, in this regard. Uh, also, uh, we need to think about when we're engaging OBDs that we need, first of all, to make this uh, engagement accessible itself. Uh, so if the engagement is not accessible, you are not going to get the result that you are aiming to. So making, uh, for example, the information about the accessibility policy uh, in accessible format and share it with OBDs in advance in order uh, to prepare for such consultation. Uh, many times also OBDs lack resources to engage and to provide technical support uh, when they are engaged. So we need also to find out if there is any resources that could be mobilized in order to guarantee uh, that they will be uh, really participating and also uh, provide reasonable competition for that uh, for that uh, engagement. For example, uh, I'm, I'm a blind person. If I have been asked to engage, I need my personal assistant to be with me, and this is uh, require some mobilization of resource. Uh, again, uh, also we need to see the OBDs around our cities, the OBD around our country. So uh, generally, we need to make sure that we reach out to the umbrella organization in way. Uh, we have a representation of different group of personal disabilities, acknowledging that uh, disability, personal disabilities are not homogeneous group. So we need to uh, find out uh, their umbrella organization in way we guarantee uh, the representation of, of uh, uh, disability groups, specifically uh, the groups that are often forgotten, such as deafblind and personal intellectual disabilities, uh, so-called uh, person uh, from unrepresented group. Uh, finally, to share that in IDA, International Disability Alliance, as we are a global alliance of OBDs uh, with uh, several members, global and regionally, including uh, World Blind Union, uh, we have um, we have we establish a help desk in where we mobilize the knowledge within the OBDs and support the engage of OBDs, uh, provide technical support from OBDs perspective. So uh, also we will be happy to support any cities or any partners that they would like to get. Uh, perspective of OBDs, or they would like to engage with OBDs at a specific uh, countries or a specific region. Uh, thank you, and I will uh, get back to you, Hannes. Sure. Thank you. Thank you so much, Alradi. And I think one very important you po point you highlighted, which is, is very close to my heart, is 
we are often in many times in discussion. So how do we create more accessible uh, pedestrian areas or public spaces or buildings or transportation systems? And it's all about co-creation to really engage communities, right? So as much as it's about the accessibility of our urban environments or across the rural continuum, it's also about how do we design a process which is inclusive and also ensures accessibility across, which ensures that we as persons with different disabilities uh, and intersecting groups can equally participate and contribute to the process. So thank you so much for, for highlighting that aspect of accessibility as well. And I'd like to hand over the mic uh, to Federico uh, for some quick reflections to, to add uh, to, to Alradi's insights as well. Uh, from your perspective, how can local and regional governments specifically engage with the, with the organized constituencies and what are the steps uh, local and regional governments together with national governments can take to improve on accessibility as part of localization? And it's always asking me to be quick and he knows I'm Latino, so it's gonna be really hard. Uh, <laughs> so, <laughs> so I think, I mean, one of the things I always think about is, is listening, right? And I think that that's also what UCLG has been trying to really promote. I mean, we're getting better at it, it's not perfect, but I think really thinking about, you know, cities listening and not only listening, but creating those mechanisms that would allow for, uh, organizations of persons with disabilities and older persons associations to really engage uh, into the policy making uh, process. And this includes the, the idea, ideation. So not bringing the idea right away, but also making that idea a co-creation, uh, the process of, of developing that idea, uh, then the mechanisms that uh, were implemented and also the mechanisms for monitoring. So I think taking that listening uh, and really putting it into localization of the global agendas is really key. Um, and then um, I always bring this back that I think it's really critical and it's not only a good thing to do, but uh, I think really asking the question, and we've had this within our membership, is if we have 16% of the population who are persons with disabilities, um, do you see a similar representation also within your staff and at the municipality and kind of asking yourself why and those will bring in some things that um, uh, Alradi was mentioning is are those uh, mechanisms accessible for being part of the, the municipality's workforce and, and being engaged at the decision making uh, role. So I wanted to be short there, but this is kind of my reflection. I think it's really key on in terms of representation and also strategically listening. Thank you so much for, for really bringing in that sort of list, uh, like cities are listening perspective uh, as well. I mean, listening is what will also inform actions, right? Listening is also a process where you also hear experiences and evidence and learn of insights in your communities. Um, and it will ultimately impact what we do on a daily basis, isn't it? It's about learning. Um, and uh, I like to, I like to hand over to after, just to add to what you mentioned, I, I'd really like to, to hear from you, Catherine, from your older person's uh, perspective on this, like what steps does natural government and local government have to take as part of localization, addressing accessibility barriers? And mm -hmm. How can Great. local and regional governments also engage with our constituencies? Great, thank you very much. And I wanna just jump into something you just said, Federico, because it made me realize that that's probably true that the representation of persons with disabilities within government employees and even at the higher level is modest. But my guess is that there are many older persons. And yet, as I mentioned earlier, that doesn't mean that those older officials or older staff ever think about the needs of older persons. And um it is one of those dilemmas that we're working on. And part of it is to do the kind of audit you're talking about to make people realize that when they're looking at implementation of architecture, of public space, of whatever, that they consider using an age lens. And this is something that has existed for gender. There's a gender lens, but I've just recently learned about an age lens, which basically says you don't tick off the box and say how many people with disabilities or older person attended event, but what 
impact did it have on their lives? So it's really looking more at the impact than at whether you followed some kind of a checklist. So that was one thing. Uh, I mentioned earlier the World Health Organization Age-Friendly Cities, and they focus on eight domains, which again, exist and should be followed for every cohort, every group. It's on housing, particularly using universal design, which we know if it works for any, any of our two groups, it should work for everybody. Transportation, it should be accessible and affordable. Older uh, outdoor spaces and buildings, we learned with COVID how absolutely critical having a place to go to be able safely to interact and not to be isolated. During COVID, the majority of the deaths were from older persons who lived in institutions in, in long-term care, and they were completely isolated without having any opportunity to go outside or to see their family. That is a lesson we have to learn from. Third, fourth, community support and health services. Health services as you were saying already that that meet the needs of the particular people, not is again a checklist that someone has learned in medical school should be done for everybody, but what are the particular needs and how to listen, as you've all been saying, to the person you're supposed to be supporting. Communication and information, as you said, always in accessible formats social participation, respect and social inclusion, and then most important, civil participation and employment. And I have two just brief examples because you're putting the two questions together. So let me put those in just to show you how it can be done. One of the members of the GAP Older Persons uh, Partner Constituency Group is Ina Volker, who represents a German National Association of Senior Citizens Organizations. And it's incredible, since 1994, they have been mandated by the government to make a report on older people in the country. And the 2020 report focused on older people and digitalization. Also, a second example, another member of our uh, constituency group, Aging Nepal, has worked closely with various local governments to offer literacy classes to older rural and urban residents and to work with them in improving their lives in all aspects. And it always starts, as we all know, with grassroots people seeing a problem, defining it, trying to find a local solution. If it succeeds, as Ian, what you said and others said, then the government, local government, of course, being invited to hand out a certificate or somehow being honored, they suddenly realize, ah, these people have figured out a solution. Maybe we can join those efforts. And in Nepal, this is happening now in a very rural, very mountainous uh, country where older women in particular have been totally left out. And they not only can now interact with their literacy learning in the markets, they can vote in elections. And what I'm most excited about, they have formed their own social group outside their home and are given that kind of um, interaction that they never had before when they were unable to get outside their families and their homes. So those are two good examples. Thank you so much for, for sharing that. Those very practical examples, uh, Kathy. I'd like to hand over the, the mic to, uh, sorry, uh, I'd like to hand over the mic to uh, Martha uh, to really hear your perspective on like, what can national governments do to work together with local governments on localization, addressing accessibility barriers, and what are the steps you see uh, local governments can also engage with the various constituency groups? Uh, please uh, keep it brief. <laughs> Thank you, Hans. Yeah, I will. Uh, I will keep it brief. Uh, so, what I have already been talking about, it's very important: the multi-level governance component. And that's why uh, national governments must work alongside the local and regional governments and local communities uh, to create enabling environments for localization to happen. Um, they have to give to local and regional governments the financial, technical, and legal capacities uh, for them to be able to deliver on their mandate. Uh, at the same time, the local and regional governments 
must seek the collaboration of the national counterparts and foster policy alignment with the national frameworks. So that would be the way to create this vertical coordination that we are looking for. But at the same time, and uh, related to what we were saying now, it's very important the multi-stakeholder engagement in all of this process. Uh, it's not only, we are not only talking about governments, we are talking about people, we are talking about different stuff that needs to be brought. And sometimes, unfortunately, governments do not bring it up. So that's why it's very important for multi-stakeholders to be part of the conversation. So, for example, the other day in the UN Habitat Assembly, that was last week, uh, there were two days of Global stakeho Stakeholders Forum, which is very important to bring all of these voices into not only uh, the national level, but also the global level and make sure they have an impact on what is being discussed. For example, during the resolutions that, uh, by the way, the first resolution on uh, SDG localization was approved uh, during last uh, week in the assembly. Uh, the, the global stakeholders had the voice to also um, um, participate in the resolutions in some of the wording that was being used. For example, accessibility, sometimes it's not being used in the, in the right way. So they had the role of saying that. So little by little, of course, it's not enough, but little by little, they are being positioned in all of these um, arenas. Also, for example, putting uh, an example in the case um, of Barcelona City Council, uh, Barcelona has been working in accessibility in various domains, and it's collaborating with the regional and national uh, governments to make sure that this is happening as well as with uh, disability and other organizations to make sure to create this inclusive city that we are looking for. And uh, last but not least, uh, I would like to say that um, there's a lot of things that national and local governments should be doing, such as uh, creating these alignment policies, inclusive public services, also raising awareness, building capacity, ensuring this collaboration with the OPDs, and also to monitor and evaluate the effectiveness on what are they doing. And here is when the voluntary local reviews comes into place. The voluntary local reviews are, as the name says, voluntary reviews that uh, the local and regional governments engage, in which uh, they talk about their, um, their progress towards the SDGs. And in this one, of course, there are some SDGs that talk about inclusion and accessibility and so on. So it's the way also for cities and other governments to realize what are like their... Uh, so for example, the city of Surabaya in Indonesia um, explained in the VLR, how they are doing a disabled friendly city and explain some examples and so on. So I want to, to make it as uh, short as possible. So that would be it from my side. Uh, from UN Habitat, we are working on that, uh, trying to leave no one behind as the core principle of the 2030 agenda says. And um, this is the way we think we have to move forward to achieve so. Thank you. Thank you so much, Marta. And I mean, the leadership from you and Habitat also when it comes to accessibility and, and, and also the leadership's commitment to accessibility as a very practical uh, approach to, to solve some of the bottlenecks we see today in, in urban and uh, across urban and rural areas is, is just amazing. So thank you for that. Uh, just very quickly over to you, Ian. You will have the last word before we go over to the closing of today's session. I just... Yeah. Uh, very briefly, I would like to hear your perspectives and if you have any general perspectives uh, based on this discussion today you'd like to share, please go ahead. Yeah, well, well I'll be very, very quick because I'm conscious of time, but just to build a little bit on what's been said on those la that last kind of double question. For me, I think um, national you know, government, uh, I think, yes, has, has certainly has a, a role to play in building in the engagement of, of OPDs, for example, into the development planning 
process through through national policies and, and the like and supporting those mechanisms through I think training is probably net needed I think through resource and capacity is important to really support and, and allow that to, to happen and then for me at the local level with thinking about local government I really see local government as that intermediary really bridging the gap as it were between kind of disabled people's organizations and disabled members of the community and developers you know coming in to actually create the change in commute cities and communities so there's a facilitation role that local governments can play and I think what becomes critical then is 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 the the strength of relationships to build really strong relationships between local governments and local OPDs local disabled people's groups panels individuals businesses build those strong local relationships i think will really reap rewards in, in the future and also ensuring that the that disabled people and, and disabled people's organizations are paid for their time and they're recognized for the value of the contributions they will give which are immense um it's, it's effectively consultancy and should be should be rewarded as such thanks so much for that closing, uh, Ian. Much appreciated, and thank you all uh, for being part of this discussion. But and I, of course, you feel free to stay. But I like to hand over the mic to to Federico to really share a quick snapshot of what we have been working uh, on for for some time now, together with most of you and your organizations in the room today, uh, among the list of speakers. Uh, because moving forward, we have put together uh, recommendations and a policy brief on on accessibility and localization. So I'd just like to hand it over to you, Federico, to just share a snapshot about this. Uh, sure, yeah. So uh, I hope everybody can hear me because um, I'm looking at the screen now. Um, so yes, we've uh, been working on a, a policy brief um, that's uh, recommendations to state parties for immediate action uh, and related to the Article 9 on accessibility and implementing it and really bringing it down to the, the local level. Uh, and this puts in the, the, con the context of the Neurovin agenda and, um, and the SDGs. Um, but uh, yeah, this, uh, if, I, if I'm correct, uh, Hannes can uh, say after, uh, but this should already be online on the World Bank Union's website. Uh, so I really, um, for the moment, we have the recommendations um, on there, and soon we will have the full policy brief in uh, English, Spanish, and French uh, available as well. Um, and this, as Hennis was mentioning, uh, included a lot of uh, close collaboration with, with uh, the speakers today, their organizations, um, and it wouldn't have been uh, as, in, as rich as it was without, the, uh, without these valuable contributions. And um, it really goes into the purpose and, and need for this uh, multi-stakeholder collaboration, also multi-level, uh, governance in which we call a more inclusive multilateral system uh, that would allow for this local and, and uh, national context to really help inform um, the, the global goals. Um, and uh, uh, the recommendations that you can already see now um, are in three points, looking at the participa participation and coordination needed, the harmonization um, between policies and standards, um, and uh, the data and capacities uh, to really make sure that um, Article 9 uh, can be a key cornerstone of what we do around SDG localization and also the realization of the new urban agenda. So uh, as we're running out of time, uh, Hannes. Uh, yeah, sure. That was a very quick and short uh, presentation, Federico. Uh, love it. Uh, in an ideal world, we would have a lot more time to, to also dive in a bit more to these recommendations. But what has been absolutely amazing today is that all of these recommendations actually touch upon the topics and also recommendations and ways forward touched upon by our speakers. So it really, it's really a great way to end today's session. And um, I believe that we have post or about to post the, the, the direct link to the publication, uh, to this short set of recommendations. Uh, to the World Blind Union website. And as, as also highlighted, the full version, uh, including scope, um, 
obligations of, of state parties, etc., and the global state of accessibility will be contained in the full version, uh, which will also be available on the World Land Union and UCLD websites uh, roughly within the coming week, also across French and Spanish. So with that said, uh, I'd like to thank you all so much on behalf of the World Land Union and our co-organizers today uh, for taking your time in a very hectic COSP 16 week to be part of the conversation. And in case you have had do you have any follow-up questions either directly to any of the speakers today or to the World Land Union, feel free to contact us through our info email, which is info at wbu.ngo. And we'll take it from there. We do apologize. We were, have not been uh, able to take live questions today, but this is an ongoing conversation. And we are all need, it's all necessary for us to be in this conversation, to move forward, to create a more inclusive and accessible world where everyone can be free from discrimination and also very happy lives. So thank you all so much for today and uh, see you soon. Thank you, bye. Thank bye. you, bye. Thanks,